Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Where's Brian Cummings when you need him? Um, uh, my name is Josh Grill. I'm uh, the, the director of UCI Mind, uh, the Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders. Welcome to this uh, really delightful uh, opportunity to honor the career of, of Dr. Carl Kotman. Um, we're so gratified to have this opportunity and, and uh, especially pleased that Carl is here um, to welcome old friends uh, and, and current colleagues as we um, uh, effort to acknowledge and remember and honor the amazing productivity and substantial contributions that Carl and his lineage have made to our understanding of the brain, the aging brain, and brain disease. Um, I first came across Carl's papers as a graduate student studying the aging dendritic architecture of the cerebral cortex on the other side of the country. Um, but anyone who was studying aging really had to become familiar with Carl's work. I then uh, saw him from uh, the perch of UCLA, where I was part of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center as a giant in our field and a towering figure nearby who had led an ADRC um, from the beginning of the system in which I consider myself to have grown up. In 2015, I had the opportunity to come to UC Irvine uh, and Carl was incredibly welcoming to me despite his um, illustrious status of still remaining an influential leader in everything that we were doing as an institute and an EDRC. He opened his, his office to me to talk about the ideas that I wanted to bring to UC Irvine and was incredibly welcoming and supportive of me as I embarked upon a career here. All of you know the impact that Carl has made. You also know uh, the obligatory statistics that I'll throw at you now that Carl, who grew up in the Midwest um, and went to college in Ohio, in Ohio at Worcester College um, before doing a, a master's at Wesleyan and a PhD at Indiana University, uh, immediately after that arrived here at UC Irvine in 1967. Um, as an assistant professor in what was then the Department of Psychobiology. Obviously, he quickly and successfully ascended through the ranks, becoming a full professor and joining the Department of Neurology. With Tuck Finch, who's here, he was the original founding director of an ADRC between UC Irvine and USC, successfully uh, spun that off into an independent ADRC. He founded the Institute that is now UCI Mind um, and is single handedly responsible for the remarkable national and international presence that UC Irvine has in Alzheimer's disease and has been a major contributor to our understanding of the aging brain and, and um, synapses, uh, uh, regeneration, uh, the list goes on and on. Carl has received numerous awards for his career's work, having published some 800 papers and many other textbooks. He's been given the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Alzheimer's Association, uh, the UCI Medal, uh, the NIA Leadership and Excellence in Alzheimer's Disease Award, the Bristol Myers Neuroscience Medical Research Award, the Metropolitan Life Foundation Award for Medical Research, the Allied Corporation Achievement Award for Aging, the list goes on and on. He's a giant. He's had huge impact, and he's had impact on many people in the room today. Our goal today is not to make this feel formal, despite my attire. Um, it's about you, Carl. It's about telling you what an impact you have had. And because of that, we have no less than 26 people who have requested to speak. And so I will not further delay us from hearing from the people who are here to honor your contributions. Um, I will play MC at times. I will 
simply queue up a video or read a letter from a person you have affected. Um, but we will uh, work systematically through a relatively large agenda of people who want to speak. Uh, and we will have time towards the end when others will have the opportunity uh, to speak if, if they weren't on our schedule. To get us started, I'm going to invite Dr. Tuck Finch from USC uh, to, to make his remarks. Well, let it be said that Carl is a Promethean presence in the field and in the room and has been in my thinking for since 1972 when we met. And I came at that point as a, uh, USC's first neuroscientist when there was no other on campus. And I found friendships uh, at Irvine that weren't available at UCLA for whatever reason. And I was working on a topic that didn't exist in the literature called the neurobiology of aging. And Carl and colleagues were very interested and we resonated. And then a key event happened in the uh, fall of 1983, Robert Butler, who was then uh, at director of the National Institute on Aging, said there ought to be an Alzheimer's Center program. NICHD didn't want to touch it. And so NIA took it and uh, opened discussion for an initial group of five centers. And uh, naturally enough, uh, UCLA was, uh, took the lead. Uh, USC and Irvine uh, were on the map but it was it seemed larger from most people that UCLA had the strongest towers at this point in Alzheimer's per se. So uh, we said, uh, they said, we would like uh, UCI and USC to have uh, components of this. And we put together uh, reasonable packages. And then three weeks in January, three weeks before the proposal, was going to be submitted, they called up, and I won't name names, and said, it's, there isn't enough money to go around by ourselves. And Carl and I got white hot activated and put together a highly competitive uh, center that came in fourth in the nation, and, you, and we, with uh, Hopkins, uh, UCSD, uh, Harvard, and UCLA came in 26th. <laughs> so all due respects for wonderful science that continues to be done at UCLA. Irvine has been a wonderful partner at, at USC over those 40 years. I ran the Alzheimer's Center for 20, and at some point the NIH split us off because we had uh, the largest amount of money uh, for any Alzheimer's Center, and so that uh, was divided into two different pro programs with, with lots of synergies. So I have uh, some slides that I'm not going to show simply because uh, they represent uh, ver uh, written statements of what I've said and I, what I believe and what you will hear from many other colleagues. Carl, you are a great presence in all of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitch. I believe we next have a video from Dr. Bruce Miller. Carl, this is Bruce Miller from University of California, San Francisco. Like all of the people at this wonderful gathering, I'm wishing you the best in the next uh, phases of your career. You have been an inspiration uh, to me and to many uh, in so many different ways. The astounding work that you uh, uh, first developed around 
uh, growth factors, animal models of Alzheimer's disease uh, gave us the first inkling that these disorders might uh, actually be treatable. Uh, it was a paradigm shift when this work started in your laboratory, but uh, you had the courage uh, to continue it. And uh, I think we're now uh, reaching the stage where we're re really going to see great things happen from this. The, the other thing uh, I, I so admire is the pioneering work you did uh, around exercise, lifestyle measures, the breadth of uh, your capacity uh, to take on many different things uh, related to Alzheimer's disease is really unparalleled. Uh, Carl, you're, you're one of a kind, and a brilliant uh, brain and a real passion for humanity. Um, I uh, can't thank you enough for your inspiration and uh, uh, wishing you the very best in the coming years, Bruce. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Malcolm Dick. There's Carl at the back. Okay. It's so good to be here among so many colleagues and friends to honor Dr. Carl Kotman. It was my privilege to work with Carl since I arrived at UCI in 1984 on a postdoctoral fellowship. And I worked with Carl all the way through until about two years ago when I retired. As a postdoctoral fellow, I set out to investigate motor learning and memory in Alzheimer's disease. And that focus quickly took me out into the community to seek participants in the few, very few places that offered services. At that time, which was essentially almost 40 years ago, the number of dementia specialists in Orange County, you could probably count on the fingers of one hand. And um, <clears throat> there were very few places that offered services at the time. So um, we were really faced with very little specialists, very little services for patients with Alzheimer's disease. So that was the context that in about 19... Um, 84, the leaders in Orange County developed the Alzheimer's Association. And just a few years later, in 1989, Carl landed a grant from the California Department of Aging to establish one of the 10 Alzheimer's disease centers at UCI. But for Carl, that was really only the start. As Dr. Finch mentioned, we served, served as a satellite site for the Alzheimer's Center at USC. And then UCI moved forward under Carl's leadership once again to establish an independent, federally funded Alzheimer's Disease Research Center on campus in 20, 2000. Then to further broaden the impact, Carl then led the formation of an organized research unit which we know as UCI MIND, to facilitate the collaboration of researchers interested in aging and dementia spread across the many departments and uh, programs at UCI. While I, meant, I imagine that many of the speakers today will focus on Carl's numerous scientific accomplishments, I want to emphasize the impact Carl had on individuals with Alzheimer's disease and their families through the clinical services that were part of his efforts from the very beginning. Indeed, during my years as a clinic neuropsychologist, I observed Carl had sort of a unique ability to recruit clinicians and staff who had worked together effectively as a team to fulfill the mission of caring for families with the disease while simultaneously they were able to advance research. We all know Carl is a strong-minded leader, yet he had the wisdom to seek out those who were doing the hands-on clinical work 
while uh, he did not always agree with our suggestions and ideas, we knew that he carefully considered and respected our input. And in hindsight, that was probably a good decision, Carl. So much will be said this afternoon about Carl's accomplishments, but from my perspective as a clinician, the most important point I'd like to leave you with is the impact he made on the lives of thousands of individuals with Alzheimer's disease and their families. Through the establishment of the state and federally funded clinics and then UCI Mind, families were able and continue to be able to obtain sort of state-in-the-art diagnostic services and are guided in terms of the needs that they might have for uh, help as they start this journey. Um, interestingly, and in, in this service we provided was an invaluable gift for families who in many cases became participants in our federally funded research program. And they have um, helped us to expand our knowledge about the medical uh, biological mechanisms underlining Alzheimer's disease, as well as the social and psychological support needed for those impacted. So in a world nearly 40 years ago, where there was so little known about Alzheimer's disease, and only a handful of resources existed, Carl was one of the few in Orange County breaking new ground to help the growing number of older adults with cognitive impairment. So as Josh mentioned, we stand on his legacy and I think we can best honor him by putting our hearts and minds, as he did, into continuing to make the life better for people with Alzheimer's disease and the related dementias through research on prevention, treatment and care. So I am very grateful to be here to honor Carl. Carl was sort of the, has uh, really facilitated my career at UCI, and I am forever grateful to him for doing that. Thank you very much. We'll next hear from Dr. Andrea Tenner. Okay, so this is a picture in 2004 of Carl receiving the UCI medal for many of the same things, many of the things that people have already talked about today. That was a long time ago and he had um, accomplished so much um, in that period before then. And then again, after that. One of the important things I think um, that really makes me think about Carl is his vision, uh, his ability to see through uh, where the problems are and where the possibilities are. And of course, one can always talk about that in, your, in everybody's individual case, and I'm going to do that for my individual case, because I really think that Carl, um, back in 1992, so that's over 30 years ago, um, I had met him and he read a paper in PNAS, and he said, what is this with complement as part of inflammation? This must have something, you know, this uh, appears to have something to do with Alzheimer's disease. Why don't we look at that? I'll teach you about Alzheimer's disease because I knew nothing about a brain, although I knew it was there. Um, and if you teach me about complements. So uh, we did it. I've always mentioned that Carl Kottman sucked me into the neuroscience field and he did, and it, it was a great ride. Um, so, but it was his vision and his intellect that was able to, um, that guided him in doing that. And um, I think it was really, um, again, as others have mentioned, he would, he was brilliant in and of himself, but he was also able to reach out and collaborate um, with other people and bring them in to the field to see, you know, if we could get things going faster. He was um, very strong work ethic. I remember uh, a Friday night at 9 p.m. He called me to see how I was doing on the program project grant. 
and he was calling from the East Coast. <laughs> um, but his, um, that, that work ethic and um, drive was really built on curiosity. And um, I think that he was so um, devoted also, as others have said, to translational medicine and also to making sure that we had the next generation of scientists coming up that would be able to continue on with these uh, investigations to make life better for those with Alzheimer's disease. And um, for that, Carl started 40 years ago, the training grant on the neurobiology of aging, and it has been renewed for 40 years. Um, so it was um, delightful to be working with him on that for the last few years um, on that as well. So, you know, we all know Carl has that quiet smile, but a ready one, um, and a really neat sense of humor and a, a great chuckle, which I will always remember. And um, I should, um, I, could you advance those, that picture? Uh, yeah, so this was in 2014 when Carl gave the, a really outstanding address to our UCI Mind um, community members. And it was so targeted so well to everybody. It was really wonderful. And so at that event, in the next slide, you can see he had his family. Um, his kids were there as well. And the next picture shows the rest of his family, which is his lab and his family. And so he kind of um, says, it's all one life. Yes, you have different segments of different things, but you're one person and you incorporate everybody into your passion and what you want to accomplish. And he has really accomplished a lot. Thank you, Carl, for sucking me in and giving me such a good ride. Next, we'll hear from Cheryl Cotman. Um, but we really want to thank all of you for being here tonight. We know he, that all of you have had a pivotal role in his passions and love of science. So I wrote a little things down. So as you know, his life is pretty much all about science, but it's infiltrated with his intelligence, good, hum good humor, and what he'd call the good old Midwestern work ethic. <laughs> At the dinner table, the common co co opening question was like, so dad, did you discover anything today? <laughs> in fact, my oldest sister remembers being in a college course and they're getting taught this theory. And then she's like, wait a second, I think my dad already proved that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so our dad loves to garden. Um, when he was in town, not giving lectures across the country, typically cruise around, around, around his yard, checking out his latest plants and seeing how they're doing. He had a pet goose, Emily. I don't know if many of you know that. <laughs> Emily would follow him around the yard, maybe take a sip of his wine or two, but <laughs> um, we always all had tasks to do. He didn't let us lounge around much. <clears throat> Once my brother and I tried the argument of, Hey, our friends get like 10 bucks for washing the car. He just looked at us and was like, go wash the car. <laughs> so that didn't work. That's the good old Midwestern work ethic there again. <clears throat> Pruning and fertilizing the roses, as well as taking care of the pool became my job. And then one day I realized, hey, dad doesn't even like getting wet, much less going swimming. Yeah, he built this pool in his backyard for his children to have hours of fun in. So it's really, you know, we do things in a, in a way. <clears throat> Pretty amazing to put a pool in your backyard if you don't like swimming or being wet. <clears throat> Regularly, he'd leave us notes on the kitchen counter, like the to-do list of, hey, do this, do this, do that. And any of you guys read his handwriting? It's <laughs> not easy to decipher. So I tried to use that excuse once. 
yeah, that didn't work. So <laughs> meanwhile, years later, I'm working in the lab. People would come up to me and be like, Cheryl, do you know what this says? <laughs> and I'm like, unfortunately, yes, I do, because I tried to pretend I didn't know how to read his handwriting. So <laughs> outside of work, our, our dad would take on involved uh, home projects. We remember a childhood memory of being woken up with his booming voice. Kids, it's time to lay the sod. We're like, what? He had us out there rolling out the lawn, stomping on it <laughs> right in the morning. He had his little Cotman work crew there. So definitely, um, we have photographic evidence of that too. It's pretty funny, all of us out there, out there rolling out these big heavy things of grass. He loved his grass, so. We took very good care of it after that. Uh, one time after an afternoon of fixing the sprinkling and drip systems, this was not his favorite task. He grumbled, it's like trying to push a spaghetti noodle across a rugged terrain. <laughs> Interesting and funny way of putting that, though perfectly logical. If you think about trying to push something across a rugged terrain, that's got to be difficult. He installed herring um, bone wood floors, beautiful maple wood in his study where he'd spend, did I mention, hours upon hours leaning into his grants, grant after grant, after granty grant grant. <laughs> Many of our childhood memories of him are always him working on grants. Um, there'd be one very, very critical deadline, and then once that was accomplished, then there'd be a very important deadline. And um, when he'd get an award or a faculty member would recognize our surname, it began to make a little sense. When I was very little, my mom mentioned this guy named Carl, and I was like, who's that? <laughs> she patiently explained, well, that's what I call your father, so who is this guy, Carl, right? After much verbal judo in my feisty early 20s, my dad and I became friends. We've even been able to say it like it is, including your complete pain in the you can decide who said that to who. <laughs> um, growing up, we used to play croquet. Interestingly enough, just as one of the kids started to win, our dad would come up with a rule that he hadn't quite disclosed before, somehow to his benefit. <laughs> um, interesting, he did like winning. Years later, my sister Dan and I have had the pleasure of being able to play tennis with him. He's got a mean angle shot. When waiting for a server volley. Um, though he did tell me I serve like a girl. <laughs> um, however, if a shot or point or tough call, believe me, it always happens to be in his favor. Um, <clears throat> when there was an overhead shot, you know, you got to put your arm up. He's so leaning into his grants all the time that he wasn't so good at getting those overhead shots. <laughs> With our dad, there's always room for improvement. For a while on Tuesday evenings, we go, uh, him and I would go paint live models. He'd look over at my painting and start going, you know, you should really fix that. And I, hey, work on your own painting. <laughs> Why did you? So we agreed to, you mess up your painting, I'll mess up my painting. <clears throat> Through all that, um, he has been encouraging of our endeavors and always supportive of our education and innovation. We're quite super grateful to have you here tonight. So last week, in case he wasn't able to come, I asked, is there anything he, he, you'd like me to convey to your colleagues? Without skipping a beat, he said, be bold in your ideas and forward in your thinking. So you have a <laughs> you got your work cut out. Sure. Next, Dr. Charlie Glabe. there's some recurring themes here so I'm going to contribute to one of the major ones and that is I wouldn't be here without Carl Cotman 
And I don't know what I'd be doing if, without him because he was such a good mentor. So my story starts in 1985 when I came here as an assistant professor and I was in Steinhaus Hall. And right away, I knew that there was something special about Carl because he had the entire first floor and I come from UCSF where space really matters. And Stan Prusner was working in a lab that was smaller than Carl's office. So I knew there was something going on here. But it was just a couple of years later that I ran, I mean, I, when I came here, I ran into an old friend of mine from graduate school. His name was Rich Bridges. He's one of Carl's postdocs. And we were graduate students together at UC Davis in biochemistry. So one day Rich came to me and he asked me if I'd make a peptide for him because he knew I made synthetic peptides. He had it written down on a piece of paper and he told me, we'll give you $30,000 and a technician salary for a year if you make this peptide. And that was a lot of money back then. So I, I didn't even ask him what it was. I said, ah, sure. So Rich asked me how long it's gonna take. And I told him it's gonna take about five or six weeks. Now really it should have taken 40 hours. And, and it did, it actually did. And so I'd, I'd finished it early, but I didn't want to disappoint and, make, and not miss, make my deadline. So Rich comes back after two weeks and he says, Charlie, there's two things you need to know about this peptide. The first thing is it's believed to be the causative agent of Alzheimer's disease, so you might want to be careful about how you handle it. <laughs> and I almost fainted. I was so terrified. He said, it might be like these prions that Stan Prusner has been talking about. And so I go, oh my God because you know, synthetic peptides are fluffy and you know, they float around. So I probably inhaled a few micrograms of this stuff. And then the next thing that uh, Rich told me made me feel better, he said, and by the way, it's the world's most insoluble peptide. And he rattled off all this stuff that it wouldn't dissolve in. And I said, Rich, that's not a peptide, that's nylon you're talking about. And so it made me feel better because I knew he was, he was lying about the insolubility because I already had made it. I had it in this tube. And so I showed it to him, look, it's not insoluble, it's soluble, because I'm purifying it. And he told me, you must have screwed up. <laughs> so he made me take that $30,000 and prove to him that it was really real. So we sequenced it. And I met this guy, this new guy named John Yates, was from Caltech, he worked with uh, Lee Hood. He said, oh, drive up to Caltech and we'll put it in the mass spectrometer. So I drove up there and they had parking right in front of the building in Caltech, you could park. And I walked into John's lab, well, actually it was Lee Hood's lab, but, and John injected in the machine and out come the single peak, 4512, it was right down to the last. So that was my entree and it's just, uh, it's just flat out luck that I got to uh, get started with Carl Kotman. But the main thing that other people have have mentioned, and I think it's a common theme, is this wasn't just a simple transaction for Carl. He recruited me. He said, well, you should work on this. Maybe you could get money. Uh, let's go on that program project grant. And so I was a member of that project program project grant from about 1990 and onward. And it's worth mentioning because I remember the number, okay? This was AG000538. And the, the end of the, the grant, when it ended, was dash 37. And those of you know what that means, that means it was 37 years running. I think it was the longest running program project grant in NIH history. And Carl had started it and kept it going, and he did it by recruiting people. So uh, it was really amazing how he did this. He not only had that program project grant, as others have mentioned, he started the ADRC with Tuck, and he, uh, he started what became the Mind Institute. And he did it by recruiting a diverse group of scientific people that had diverse scientific expertise and approaches. And he also included people that had different points of view, different, uh, different uh, specialties, different hypotheses to work on because these institutes didn't have a dogma that you had to reinforce of one particular way of looking at Alzheimer's disease. Carl was interested in everything that made sense because he was interested in actually finding a cure. So the amazing thing is this legacy, as you know, is going on and is now being extended and continued by Frank and Josh and, um, and it, I don't think it's a boastful to say that it is the best 
Alzheimer's Disease Center in California, and, and certainly one of the best in the world. So, and lastly, I've got kind of a cool vignette about Carl, because Carl and I went to a lot of meetings together. And Carl likes meetings, especially ski meetings. But there was one meeting in Sorrento, Italy, that I especially remember. And it's because there was a strike, the airline strike. It was hard getting there. And I'd gotten there early, and I run into Carl. He just arrived there. It probably taken him 36 hours of traveling. He had the same clothes on. So he'd slept in them for probably two nights. He had a bed head. He hadn't shaved in 36 hours. And he looked like he should go to the hotel, but not Carl. He went straight to the meeting because he didn't want to miss anything. And I thought, wow, this guy's jet lagged. I can't even stay awake. So I sit next to him and he's in there paying attention. And he gets up looking disheveled and he goes over the microphone and he asks, oh, one more question. And he dropped a bomb and it was like the, a critical crest and a great insight. He was not only up for 36 hours and paying attention. And it reminded me a lot of Peter Falk in the television series, Columbo. <laughs> so he, he was on top of it, even with being sleep deprived. And I've got to say, Carl, thanks. It meant a lot to me. You still mean a lot to me and I wouldn't be here without you. And I think it's true looking around at all the people in, the, in this audience who came from the same way. Thanks. We'll next hear from Dr. David Cribbs. I'd like to begin by uh, saying that uh, I owe Carl a lot. So uh, this is a picture from about 30 years ago. Um, it's a little blurry, I apologize for that. I, I came out here uh, 31 years ago on sabbatical. I came from a small college in Maryland. And uh, how I came to know about Carl Cotman uh, was I worked summers at the Naval Research Laboratory to, to just stay active in research. Um, and if we could have the next slide. And I'm not going to go through all this because I mean, we want to have dinner and drinks and stuff like that. But uh, and it's a little bit hard for me to point. Maybe I can point. It doesn't matter. The little red box up there in the right hand corner is the reason I'm here. And I've, I've been employed here for over 30 years because the, uh, the initial thing was this little red box. Um, to the left of that, any of you that have cultured neurons can appreciate the fact that those are neurons. But what was interesting about this, this was a pattern uh, that I designed at the Naval Research Lab. The, the guy, Dave Stanger, he is the first author on this paper, uh, Microlithographic Determination of Axonal and dendritic polarity in cultured hippocampal neurons. Uh, I wanted, I was, I'd been there at St. Mary's College for six years, and I was looking for a place to go on sabbatical. And Dave says, I know this guy, Carl Kotman. You can go out to California. I thought, that's cool. I like palm trees, warm weather. I like sailing. I thought this would be a great fit. And so I took this pattern that I designed uh, using, um, uh, Photoshop, and at the Naval Research Lab, the idea was to have somal adhesion sites, these the round circles there, and to have uh, tracks where the axons would grow, and tracks with speed bumps where the dendrites would go. And so the idea was we were going to grow neurons on a surface, and we were going to build neural networks, and we ultimately we did. And, and the reason I put this slide together was to tie, show how uh, research in a laboratory over years can progress. So the, on the le lower left here is, is the example of growing on the, the pattern uh, that we, we developed at the Naval Research Lab. And I came out here and we started culturing these hippocampal neurons on the, the, the fabricated uh, plates that we had made. And I shouldn't take the time to thank Andrea Wasserman. She's somewhere. She actually, 
Oh, she's hiding from me. Um, she took the time when I first came out here. I was a biochemist. Uh, I knew a little bit about immunology and biophysics, but she took the time to teach me how to grow hippocampal neurons. Uh, and that's what I'm showing here is the axons are growing along the, uh, the solid lines there in the pattern. And the dendrites, I'd, I came up with the idea of speed bumps because Gary Banker, who had worked in Carl's lab long before, had found out that the, the longest neurite becomes the axon. So we were able, by incorporating these speed bumps that would slow down the other neurites growing, we were able to develop and, and, and uh, pattern uh, the neurons and direct the polarity of the neurons. And Ann Taylor's here. And so the, uh, several years later, Newly Jeong came in, uh, started, got recruited like everybody else by Carl, and uh, started doing that these are uh, microfluidic devices, uh, they were patented and I, Anne's doing something different now, but these things were, became commercially available and, and we were able to uh, get the, uh, put these uh, neurons on one side and have the axons grow all the way out the other side. And Matthew Blurton Jones is uh, smiling there. Uh, he was actually part of uh, this project and he actually developed the, uh, the art for the, uh, the journal cover had uh, uh, the, this one of the picture like this that Matt had configured, and we and so that was the first time I'd ever been a part of a, a paper uh, that got the journal cover. So I'm not going to uh, go ahead to the next slide. I uh, I thought I'd just talk about eras of research that I was involved in with Carl. I'm not, not going to go through all these slides, but there's a lot of people out in the audience that can see their names uh, on these various papers here. And so I call this the era of in vitro studies with amyloid beta. And actually, uh, Frank's right up there. Uh, he came up to me at a skiing meeting in Colorado uh, and said he'd like to meet Carl Cotman. Uh, I was drinking at the bar which I'm known for, and, uh, and Carl said he'd like to meet Carl. I mean, Frank said he'd like to meet Carl Cotton. I said, that's no problem, I'm here with him. And he told me about this sequence homology between the herpes GB protein and A-beta. And uh, uh, I introduced Frank to Carl, and, uh, and then on the way back, uh, and Frank and I had some other conversations about things, uh, and uh, Frank had a unique skill that I really appreciated because this was at the time when transgenic animals be started to become available and we had no one at UCI that had that capability. So on the way back, I was talking with Carl and I said, you know, we really need to get somebody who can make transgenic animals. And then we came back and, and Carl, they were already had a search in progress and Carl said, okay, find out, get his bio, get him to apply. And, and just like that, Frank became an assistant professor at UC Irvine. Uh, and actually, I, I became an assistant adjunct professor uh, four months after I arrived for eight months, um, because just like that, Carl made me an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology. So that's the way you could do things back in the good old days. So I'm, I got two more slides. Uh, the next one uh, is an era of compliment and Alzheimer's, and I was actually, uh, taken upstairs when Carl went to uh, meet Andrea Tenner and talk about complement. And the reason Carl took me was because I was the only one in the lab that knew anything about complement. So, uh, and, and so that instituted uh, a, a long, and I guess still research in uh, the role of complement in Alzheimer's disease and something I'm very interested in immunotherapy and the role of complement in what's called ARIA. And so I have a grant submitted that's gonna be reviewed in December. The next slide, uh, that brings me to the, what I call the era of uh, anti-A beta therapy. And this is, uh, this is the last slide with any kind of date or anything on it. So you just hold on for one, one or two minutes here. Um, this was actually very interesting because uh, there was a paper that came out in 1999 by Dale Shank and the Elan group. And what they showed was if they immunized with the A-beta peptide in these APP transgenic animals that develop these senile amyloid plaques in the brain, that you could block the formation of the amyloid in the brain. And so this was really exciting to me that, that you actually might have a therapy 
Um, and then it was interesting, NIA put out a, a request for applications. And uh, this was, and up until this point, I was, still, I was still working under Carl's grants, but this was an opportunity and Carl encouraged me to submit a grant. And I did that with Michael Agajanian and Liz and Carl put in a grant. So we were using APP transgenic mice and Liz had a canine model. And what was really amazing, and Liz didn't want to submit the grant because it had a, a limit of $300,000 and she figured it was going to cost $500,000, but we just decided, what the heck, we'll just submit both grants. Uh, UC Irvine was, there were only six grants that were funded and we got two of them. So, and uh, there's, uh, Carl was part of it early on. We've gone on. I, I just found out last week that we've immunized with our uh, anti A beta DNA vaccine we've already immunized four people in a phase one clinical trial. And so the rest of the slides are for fun. So if you advance the slide. So uh, Carl liked to, this was not a ski resort. I, and Frank will remember, cause he's in the picture there. Uh, a lot of you probably know Bill and Ostrom and Judy Ann, and there's young Frank. Uh, there's me, I apologize for the quality of the picture. I think that's David Holtzman in the background there. So this was a great meeting in, in Tobago, and I've got a few more slides. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is my lovely wife, Christy, and Carl and I and Christy and some other people were, they had something called Sunday School. And, and Sunday School was a party, I think it was on Sunday night, that would make sense. And so we went there to have, and we hung out with the locals. So this is me and Carl and a local with a Ravens uh, jersey on. And the next slide, oh, so I'm, that's all of Tobago. Uh, I think that was in 2000, uh, Sunday school. If you go, uh, I only have a couple more slides. And so the last time that I traveled with Carl, and I'm looking at some of the people that also traveled with Carl, and they're in the picture here, uh, I, I, uh, I invited myself to go to Tel Aviv University in Israel, uh, where they had a two-day conference, but they did a really nice job of hosting us uh, and this is a picture of a lot of the people that were there. You can see Carl in the upper right-hand corner. There's Matt and Frank and, and uh, 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 Vitaly. There, there I am. Andrea is there, Kim Green, uh, and some of the Israeli scientists, uh, Danny Michelson. And I think there's one more slide. Oh, there's, there's a two. So I'm, maybe I've gone over five minutes. Josh isn't yelling at me yet. So they, in addition to the two-day conference on Alzheimer's disease, uh, we, we got a great opportunity, opportunity to, to uh, tour uh, Israel. And this is a, not a great photo, but it's a good photo of Carl. Uh, Frank's looking the wrong way, and so is Matt. But uh, uh, it was a great sightseeing effort, a great uh, chance, no skiing. Uh, but it was, it was a great opportunity, and I really thank Frank for allowing me to tag along. And I've got one more slide. And uh, this, I believe, was at that award ceremony when Carl got the medal. Uh, and you can tell that it's a long time ago because I don't have any gray hair. Uh, but I, I, like I said at the beginning, I, I'm really thankful that Carl took the time and effort to allow me to come out here on sabbatical and then offer me a job. So, thank you. We next have doctors Eileen Anderson and Brian Cummings. Uh, that's what my instructions said. No, you're going first. All right. Wow. So, um, oh my gosh, I'm very nervous. <laughs> Look at all these people. This was really hard. I have to say, my brain is all over the place right now because I have so many stories to possibly share about Carl, and people have talked about different things about working in his lab and what he's meant um, to them over the course of their careers. And so, I think I want to highlight probably two two things, and it may take me a little bit to get there. So um, one is the idea of the impact that Carl has had on so many different people's careers. And, and, and I'll talk about that from my perspective a little bit. Brian has his own ideas. 
I came to, to Carl's lab, um, many of you may not know, at the end of my fourth year of graduate school, essentially having accused the PI that I worked with of scientific fraud. And that was a challenging thing to do in the early 90s. It was a career render by and large. I was really lucky to have an NRSA grant that I had written, so I had some money I could bring with myself somewhere, but I was on the verge of leaving graduate school. And the chair of the department, who later became the vice provost for academic personnel at UCI, sat me down and said, look, you're in a tough spot, but I'm going to try and find you a place if you want to stay in science. He went off and talked to a couple of different PIs, and he came back and said, look, I have two options for you one of whom in the department seemed really comfortable and soft and warm and fuzzy to me. And I said, I think that's where I should go. I was a little traumatized. <laughs> and he said, nope, I think you should go to Carl's lab. And I said, but he's big and scary. <laughs> and, and Herb said and to me- And your husband was already there. And Herb said to me, no, I really think this is the right place for you from, a, from an intellectual point of view. I'll talk to him and uh, we'll make it work. And when I sat down with Carl the first time, this is all we ever said about my previous four years of graduate school. He said, were you right? And I said, yes. And he said, okay, go do something new. And so I spent two years in Carl's lab finishing up my PhD in the most intellectually stimulating environment I could have imagined. I just didn't know that working in the lab or doing science like that was possible. It was unbelievably fun. I had amazing colleagues and, and I had Carl there to shoot ideas off of all the time. Like I'm emotional. It was the most amazing two years of my science scientific career. And I, I wouldn't have, I would have left science at that point. And I can illustrate how enthusiastic he was about the science um, in a couple of different ways. And, and uh, Carl and I, for those of us who were in the lab at the time, we um, spoke vociferously about our opinions in science. And we were doing this over a grant that we were writing together one day. And this poor younger graduate student had gotten pulled into this meeting. We were sitting around this little table in Carl's office. Carl and I were going at it about what the best ideas were for this grant in this like, amazing environment, perhaps somewhat loudly. And at one point, we both looked at the same time over at this graduate student, the third person who was in the room, who was completely shell-shocked and not moving. And Carl started laughing. And Carl, you looked at him and he goes, don't worry about it. We do this all the time. This is what science should be. And that is exactly what science should be. It should be finding the best ideas and tussling about them until you get the right one to go forward with. And, and that was one of the best lessons that I learned in my time in Carl's lab. He actually rec rescued me a second time in my career. Brian and I were working at Harvard, and um, it was about the time at that point where it was really tough to come by two positions. And I knew that one of us was gonna have to step out. Brian was farther along in his career than, than I was. And so um, I was looking for, for different jobs. I actually got an offer at a, the third or the second largest patent law firm um, in the country on Park Avenue, like beautiful offices, the whole kit and caboodle. And, and Carl called me up at like 10 o'clock at night, one night and said, yeah, that is not what you're gonna do. And here's why. <laughs> and maybe two hours later, the next thing I knew I had plane reservations. I was flying to an American Paralysis Association meeting where Carl hammered me for the next couple days and told me why I was gonna work on spinal cord injury instead of leaving science. And that is what I've do, done since. Um, amazing, and that is not just me. So I can follow up on spinal cord injury as an example and say he touched so many people's lives in, in different ways. Um, early on, many of you here think of him all as being about Alzheimer's work, and that's true. He's such a seminal set of con um, contributions in that area. But he was one of the first folks to be involved in the American Paralysis Association, which started as the Stifle Foundation. I still don't remember the story of how he got involved in that, but his value to that organization was huge. They revered him. One, he could talk to the board and he did it in a really collegial way where the board felt like they could understand the science and they adored him. They would listen to him in a way that they wouldn't necessarily listen to the other scientists that were involved on that board. Two, he um, picked up a woman who in the 
late 80s, was recently divorced, three young kids to raise on her own, is now a dear friend of mine, Susan Howley, who started off as a part-time secretary for that foundation. And then when it grew to be the American Paralysis Foundation, and eventually the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation and became huge for a period of time, they were looking for a director for their scientific operations. And Carl called them up and said, you have somebody in house who can do this, so you should stop now. Hire Susan Howley, she is your person for that job. And he convinced the board to bring her on in that capacity where she became the vice president for research for the next 20 years. When Carl saw someone who could do a job, it didn't matter to him what their background was. She had, she had a bachelor's degree in English. He didn't care and said she can understand the science and she can do this. She is the person that you need and she was. She was exactly what that foundation needed. His capacity to look past the surface and have that vision of how people could develop um, has been really tremendous over the years. And I think all of us, many of us have felt that in different ways. Um, I should stop and let you talk a little bit. <laughs> this is a first. <laughs> this is a, remarkable. Um, so I promised Andrea that I would just tag on to Eileen's talk. So I had no idea what she was going to say anyway. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate what you, the common theme you've heard here is collaboration. Um, and so I was a graduate student here at UCI. We went away to Harvard and I thought that it was UCI propaganda, that collaboration, that's just how we did it in Carl's lab. And that, and Carl infected the whole campus because UCI is a very collaborative place. And you've heard from many speakers tonight that when somebody came up with an idea or Carl had an idea and didn't know how to do it, he would just find somebody, recruit them and uh, suck them in with his will and set them off on a new trajectory. Uh, so he's done that all the time. And that collaborative spirit, uh, I didn't appreciate. I, I liked it, but I didn't appreciate how unique it was until I went off to Harvard. And I'll just, I don't know if they've changed in the 20 plus odd years, but not collaborative back when we were there. And so as he was recruiting Eileen back to Irvine, I'm like, oh man, what am I going to do? Because it's two bodies, the two body problem. I'll just tag along. I came back and Carl, who was not recruiting me, he was recruiting Eileen for the Paralysis Foundation. Carl said, well, I'll, I'll give you a job in the brain bank. You can run the brain bank. And that was just exciting, as Liz well knows. Um, so I ran the brain bank for a little while, but it was not my career choice. And I think a lot of people don't know this part is that I decided that I was going to leave academia and go teach at a private high school. And the Sage Hill School was the first non-denominational private high school in Orange County. And I was their second uh, director of science. So I actually recruited and helped grow that program using the skills Carl taught me. Uh, but the one thing that I was about to leave Irvine and what Carl said, you don't want to go. I said, no, Carl, I do want to go. I'm going to go. And Carl said, you're going to regret it. Uh, yeah, I've heard that story before, Carl. I, I'm not going to regret it as much as you hope I do. And he said, before you leave, don't actually resign from UCI. I'm like, but I'm leaving, Carl. Get over it. And nope, I will keep you on at 10% time. Just keep your title here and go off and do your thing. Go ahead, get it out of your system. So I went off and I went to Sage Hill School. And after a year there, things were going well. And then the Parent Teacher Association decided the next building they were going to build was not the trailer homes that the science labs were. They were going to build a theater. And meanwhile, Eileen was working now uh, doing spinal cord injury research and said, come back and you can work with me. And that fact that Carl had said, don't resign, allowed me to come back easily and come back at UCI. And years later, I don't, that's been 20 plus years now, uh, I'm back at UCI. Carl has touched so many people's lives. I'm now an associate dean for faculty development in the School of Medicine. And who, who would have predicted? Who would have known? But Carl, Carl said, don't leave. And this is, you're going you're gonna to enjoy your time here. And the collaborative environment he, he provided to all of us, I think, is why we're all back here again. And, and thanking you, Carl. Uh, even though we had some, some arguments and some yelling, uh, it was all for the good of science and for the good of all of our careers, so thank you. We'll next hear from Dr. Claudia Kawas.
Hi, everybody, but especially hi, Carl. It's so, so good to see you and see everyone celebrating all of your major accomplishments. So I've got a current, I've got a recurrent theme here. Um, uh, like many people in this room, the only reason that I am standing here and at UCI for now more than two decades, it's all Carl Kottman's fault. <laughs> and some of you don't hold it against him, please. Um, when I think of Carl, I think of truly a Renaissance man. I mean, certainly in science, he was a Renaissance man. I spend all of my time telling students that they can't do everything, and Carl effortlessly made it look like they could. <clears throat> he did basic science in a lot of different areas. He did clinical science and ran clinical trials. He exercised and did research in exercise. He played tennis, you heard all of his skiing, um, and maybe the thing that amazed me the most was his painting of beautiful landscapes. And I think very few of us are talented enough to do all of those things with the incredible aplomb that he did it with. So um, for those of, of us who can't even do one thing that well, um, we really find you extraordinary, Carl. And many of us, as you've heard, are in this room because of you. And I would really like to thank you for everything that you've done for UCI, for Alzheimer's, for science, and particularly for those of us in the room who came here and followed in your footsteps and tried to do something good. So thank you, Carl. I've got a few that I've been asked to read from people who could not attend this evening. I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Greg Brewer, who's a professor in biomedical engineering here at UC Irvine. I did a sabbatical in Carl's lab in 1998 to learn neuron cell culture and change my research career. The lab was large at this time with about 10 postdocs and 10 PhD students. He was producing 20 papers a year. My six months resulted in two papers that were instrumental in the development of what is now Thermo Fisher's neurobasal B27 for serum-free defined culture of embryonic and then adult neurons of any age. I'll always appreciate Carl's clear sense of direction from avid reading of the literature and his clarity and communication of his results. The next is from Victor Nadler who was a postdoc with Carl from 1971 to 1978 and is now Professor Emeritus of Pharmacology and Cancer Biology at Duke. I wish to add my congratulations to Carl Kottman upon his completion of 50 plus years at the forefront of neuroscience. During my years there, Carl's laboratory was intellectually exciting, highly collaborative, and very productive. Carl fostered an atmosphere where new ideas were considered seriously and, with his encouragement and support, often led to findings at what was then the cutting edge of the field. I appreciate particularly his willingness to take risks in supporting some of my own projects, which were not anticipated in any of his grant applications. This period is also notable in my mind for Carl's assembling a large and remarkably talented group of trainees, most of whom used their experience to forge a successful career in academia or industry. Certainly, my experience in Carl's laboratory shaped the development of my own research group and was crucial to any success I had. I am very grateful. We will next hear from Dr. Jim Geddes. So first of all, thanks for uh, including me and, and I'm gonna continue many of the themes that we've heard and thanks to Carl for uh, really helping me get uh, a footing in my career and, 
and setting me up for the, the future of my career. Um, he provided incredible opportunities, mentorship, and I think something that hasn't yet been mentioned is also by being part of Carl's lab, the network of, of Kotmanites that you became part of, and the, um, the, just the camaraderie of, of that group uh, has been instrumental in, in helping me throughout my career, and I'll touch on that in a, in a couple of moments. Um, so I joined Carl's lab in 84 and was there until 90, and I came from um, middle of nowhere in, in Canada, in, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and, and coming to Carl's lab in Southern California, I felt like the man who fell to earth, that it was such a different environment. I'd come from a lab that there was myself and a technician, and Carl's lab had 30, post, or 30 people in it at the time, about a dozen postdocs. Um, and in addition, uh, there was the, com the faculty at, at uh, UC Irvine, which was amazing. Uh, Ricardo Milady had just uh, uh, was setting up shop down the hall, and you had all these visitors coming through. Uh, uh, some I remember, uh, for example, Francis Crick coming to Carl's lab meetings to talk about consciousness. John Eccles would drop by. Uh, Richard Morris of the Morris Water Maze. Uh, it was just amazing the. Um, the network of people and, and the excitement of science that was in was at UC Irvine in the, in the uh, mid 80s, and I think you know obviously continues to this time. But uh, again, coming from Saskatoon, that was a little different than the environment that we had there. Um, so when I arrived in in 84, it was a magical year. We've already heard from Tuck that uh, that was the year that the Alzheimer's uh, their center started in collaboration with USC. Uh, it was also the year that the Macintosh computer was introduced. Uh, and so it was exciting to come to a lab where they had Macintosh computers. And I, um, you know, I think Carl might be um, probably new, but didn't make a big deal of it, that it was used for science, but it was also uh, with the advent of computers was computer games. And a lot of time was spent on Castle Wolfenstein and, and Dark Castle. Uh, so. Anyway, um, the, in 84, um, Dan Monahan had just published a paper on glutamate receptor, characterizing glutamate receptors. So the, the three major subclasses of, of um, ionotropic glutamate receptors, the NMDA, AMP, and Kinate, uh, we can thank Dan Monahan and, and Carl for, for that nomenclature. Um, AP5 had just been introduced as an NMDA antagonist, and they were testing to see what a a this NMDA antagonist did in the lab. Initial experiments did nothing, and then they found that it blocked LTP. Graham Collingridge in Britain gets the credit for the first um, mention of, of AP5 blocking LTP, but it was really Carl's lab and Eric Harris and Alan Ganong and Carl that wrote the seminal paper that um, an NMDA antagonist blocked LTP. And then Eric Harris in conversations with Rick, um, they then tried uh, uh, AP5 on the Morris water maze and showed that it blocked learning and memory in the Morris water maze. Uh, so just some really seminal findings that came out of, of Carl's lab at the time. Um, I had worked on glutamate uh, using Carl's methods on synaptosome isolation in my graduate work and came to Carl's lab to work on receptors. And uh, Ira Lott had agreed to cover my salary. I didn't, being Canadian, I didn't qualify for US training grant support. And Ira agreed to cover my salary if I worked on something related to, uh, I was interested in Down syndrome and work on Alzheimer's disease. And so we had this incredible opportunity. We had, you know, NMDA receptors. Dan Monahan had perfected the autoradiographic techniques. Uh, we knew about NMDA, Carl's work on plasticity. Uh, Brad Hyman and Gary Van Heusen had just published a paper saying that the entorhinal cortex was uh, cut off the hippocampus in Alzheimer's disease, just as Carl's and, Gary and Oz Stewart had shown with entorhinal lesions in animal models. And so we were, my role was to apply these incredible techniques to Alzheimer's 
disease. The only problem was we didn't have any Alzheimer's disease brains um, to work on. And so one of the first things we did with Carl's help was work with the Alzheimer's Association and set up um, the brain tissue repository and uh, traveled all over Southern California with uh, Dave Reedy at, at the medical center to uh, collect brain tissues and, and uh, several people in the room then continued that. And I'm thrilled uh, we dropped by the labs the other day and that repository is often obviously still going strong. Um, so I um, wanted to just add to a couple of other stories. We heard from Charlie Glabe about the, the A-beta and my recollection is that uh, with Charlie's peptide that had been uh, stimulated by Rich Bridges, there were a few attempts to try the A-beta in cell culture. And there was some debate at the time whether the A-beta was neurotrophic or, or neurotoxic or inert. And the different people in the lab were getting mixed results. And then Christian Pike was working on this. And Christian, being a good scientist, always made his A-beta up fresh and would test it on the cell cultures. Well, on Friday afternoons, we used to chip in a few dollars and, and somebody would make a run to Albertsons and get some beers and we'd come back to the lab and there's a little, one of the rooms that had about six desks in it, we'd um, cluster in there and have a few beers on a Friday afternoon. Well, we did this one Friday and, and Christian Pike decided that he, you know, after a couple of beers that he wouldn't do his, his experiment, that even though he'd made up the A-beta fresh, that he'd wait a little bit. And so then after a day or two, when he went back and applied the, the A-beta, it was toxic. And so that, they worked back and figured out that that, you know, delay allowed the A-beta to aggregate. And that was the story of how the A-beta toxicity and aggregation uh, got started. It was thanks to a couple of beers in Kotman's lab on a, on a Friday afternoon. Um, one of the other stories uh, was uh, when the APP was sequenced and it was found that it had a, at least the long form had a Kunitz protease inhibitor domain, Carl again, you know, reached out and Dennis Cunningham's lab uh, worked on protease nexins, which were Kunitz protease inhibitors. And so they were working on protease nexin one and protease nexin two. And so Carl said, well, let's see if, if you know, those are stain plaques or tangles in Alzheimer's disease. So. We had the antibodies to PN1 and PN2 and found that PN2 stained plaques. And then uh, Cunningham's lab uh, sequenced the PN2 and found that it was identical to the long form of APP. So uh, again, you know, this resulted in a, a, a nature paper. But again, you know, the history of Carl jumping onto things and uh, uh, collaborations. Um, in for my work uh, looking at the glutamate receptors in Alzheimer's disease, we did find evidence of plasticity and um, that resulted in a nice science paper. And then uh, for the NMDA receptors, we didn't find much decline in NMDA receptors. There was a subtle but non-significant drop in Alzheimer's disease. And Tim Green of Meyer and Ann Young's group at the time were making a big deal about a major loss of NMDA receptors in Alzheimer's disease. And so Carl um, wanted to make sure of this and asked uh, Dan Monahan to repeat the experiments that I'd done. At the time, I was kind of ticked at Carl that he didn't trust me enough and, and you know, asked Dan to repeat these experiments. And Dan got the same results. And we published it. And, and turns out we were right. But I, I think it just goes to another strength of Carl's, the scientific rigor that he's been instrumental in so many major discoveries over the years but they've stood the test of time. And uh, not only does he have great insight, but he's got really strong scientific rigor. And I mentioned that um, the mentorship that Carl was always encouraging. Um, one of the things I learned, and, and Eileen touched on this, that, and Brian, that um, we had our disagreements, but they were in private. And he would criticize in private and, and praise in public. And that's a great leadership lesson that I learned from Carl. Um, so I want to thank Carl for the amazing opportunity, um, the, just the incredible science, the opportunities. It was a really magical time uh, to be in his lab. And I think back when I saw the, uh, the musical Hamilton, there's a song in that called The Room Where It Happened. 
And when you think of the development of, you know, A beta toxicity, the NMDA receptors, LTP, it was, it was just thrilling to be in the room where it happened. And uh, thank you, Carl. Next year from Dr. Matthew Blurton Jones. Wow, hard to follow up after all these amazing stories and, and uh, uh, some of which I've heard, some of which like the, the Friday afternoon beers uh, <laughs> leading to amyloid toxicity I've never heard before. Fantastic stories. Um, so it, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Just, just say a few words about uh, my experience with Carl. Like, like almost everyone here, I've been uh, incredibly influenced by Carl and my scientific career. Uh, I came uh, to UCI in 2002, so not quite as long as ago as some of the other speakers here, but, but still a good 20 years ago, um, and joined Carl's lab as a postdoc. And uh, a couple examples of, of what I really learned from Carl that I, I continue to try and emulate now in my career in my own lab. Um, so one of the things that, that surprised me when I got there, having interviewed with Carl, talked the first few days, arriving about all the amazing projects that were going on, um, was that Carl turned to me and said, well, so what do you want to study? And I had fully expected that I was going to walk in, he was going to tell me, well, here's your project, here's what you got to do, and here's who you're going to work with. And so to be given that freedom, that academic freedom, to start to really try and come up with my own ideas and figure out how to put these pieces of the puzzle together to come up with something unique, was, was something I hadn't experienced before, and yet I think probably most of us scientists would agree that's what drives us. That's the, the joy of science is that discovery, coming up with new ideas and figuring out how to, how to tackle them. And I, I think Carver is really the first person to really show me the way forward to, to come up with those uh, approaches. And then related to that, you've got to figure out, once you've got your idea, you've got to figure out, well, how am I going to study it? And as we've heard now from many people, I also had the benefit of experience, experiencing really what was team science before it was a catchword at NIH. I mean, uh, Carl's lab was always full of team science, whether it was within the lab, other postdocs working together on projects. I remember Rob and I and Wayne Poon arguing nonstop about <laughs> our studies together, often being told by other people in the lab to shut up. Um, but that kind of environment allowed us to really think through and come up with the best experiments and the, and the best science. And so there was team science at that, that in-lab um, level, but also, as you've heard, Carl was never shy about reaching out to experts in completely different disciplines. And so I was lucky enough to be involved in the, in the project that, that Dave introduced with, with Ann Taylor here, where reached out to you know people working on bioengineering back when that was a pretty new area and uh, you know was able to make some some really good strides and, and move the science forwards. And, and that's something again that I think has been very influential on my own career that I've really enjoyed the ability to reach out, not be shy about reaching out to people doing completely different research and trying to collaborate to, to move the field forward. So uh, overall, like everyone here, Carl, I'm, I'm incredibly appreciative of, of everything you've done for myself or for my career and, and as everyone else is here and wouldn't be here without you, so thank you. Next here from Dr. Robert Rissman. Okay, thanks for inviting me here today, Josh and everyone. It's great to see everyone again. Um, I was a postdoc in Carl's lab, uh, like Matt, starting in 2002, and I came in from a very small lab uh, in Philadelphia where I was a graduate student. So joining Carl's lab, I came into this again, as others have mentioned, it was an entire floor. And in addition to being an entire floor, there was 15 postdocs, 10 graduate students, dozens of technicians. So I felt initially completely lost, right? And this was after I was considering 
other labs, and, and Carl had told me very uh, definitively that I would not be going to those labs. I told him, I'm going to go to a Rusty Gage's lab. I'm from San Diego. I want to be back in San Diego. It's like, no, no, no. Your wife is here doing residency at Chalk. The, the commute's going to kill you. You're not going there. I'm like, okay, whatever you say, man. So then I come into the, uh, I come into the lab, and again, you know, like Matt mentioned, I did not have a project, right? I had to think about what I might be doing. So I came into his office one day, and I said, what I really want to do is not study plaques and tangles. I mean, everyone's studying plaques and tangles, and, you know, I think they're late, um, you know, in the process. There's got to be something else that's going on in there. And, and I brought up, you know, the discoveries that he made in apoptosis and, and defining that in Alzheimer's disease. And he says to me, you know, how about this, uh, you know, Troy Roan was here. He was a postdoc at one point, and he kind of put together this concept of caspase cleavage of tau. And I'm like, what the hell? Why would you be interested in how tau is cut and, and, and you know, that's related to anything? And I thought maybe that could be related to, again, cell death, apoptosis, cell death. Uh, so we started working on that. And again, as Matt mentioned, it became a real team science project, which was, again, something I had never experienced. When I was in graduate school, I was given a project and I was told by you know, David Armstrong, you will do this, 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 and this, and then you will graduate. And uh, so being a postdoc, it was a very different experience. And so sure enough, we started looking at tau uh, cleaved by caspases. We defined which caspases cleave tau. And then uh, unfortunately, we determined that it was, fortunately, unfortunately, we determined that it was actually an early event in tangle formation. Okay, so trying to get away from plaques and tangles, I was unable to do that. Um, and then we really didn't, me, Matt, and others, we didn't really totally believe the results, right? It just didn't seem right. I don't know, you know, you're almost critical of your own work. Um, but luckily enough, other people have replicated it and indeed, Cleaving tau by caspase three is an early event in how tangles are formed. So, um, you know, I had a great experience in the lab and uh, I left in 2005, early 2005, to uh, take a position at the Salk Institute where I was a staff scientist. And I continued to develop my independent career and I still kept in touch with Carl from there. Indeed, one day I heard from Leon Thal indicating that he and Carl had met up here at UCI, which I think it was an ADRC meeting. And of all places in the men's room, uh, they were talking about how uh, Leon needed some new young faculty members at UC San Diego, and uh, Carl had suggested me. So I talked to Leon, and sure enough, we were able to almost work everything out before he uh, unfortunately passed away in a devastating accident. Um, so I remained at the Salk for a few more years, and then I was brought in a couple years later by uh, Eddie Koo and, and Paul Asen. So, but nevertheless, you know, Carl and I continued to be in touch. He was part of the ADCS, the clinical trials group. So I saw him at meetings and it was a really interesting experience to of course hear about all the new things that he was studying and uh, to keep in touch. But, you know, he really had a great impact on my career. Like many others here, I'm just not sure how I would have made it in academic science without his advice and all the openness he had. Uh, like others, you know, I used to get into his office. He used to like, you know, be aggressive and tell me, listen, you're crazy. You have no idea what you're talking about. That's definitely wrong. Uh, but then was very open to letting me try things. So it, it was a, a really fantastic experience. So Carl, I thank you for everything over the last 20 years. Um, it's been great working with you and, and thanks again so much to you and everyone else in the lab. Next, Dr. Elizabeth Head. I'm one of the shorter people. So, and actually I see there's a picture up here on the screen that's really awesome and I'm hoping you get to see it soon. So I was super delighted to be invited to say a few words um, about how Carl has impacted me. Uh, he's been a mentor, a colleague, and a really good friend over the years. So I first met Carl in 1996, and that was through uh, going to the SFN conference, presenting a poster about dog aging and cognition. And right next to me was Brian Cummings, presenting a poster on neurobiology of aging in dogs. So it was a match made in heaven. Before I even finished my PhD, I ran down to UCI and started a postdoc before my PhD was done. 
And then I finished my dissertation at UCI, and I remember photocopying things on paper. Brian's laughing. Carl was so nice. He let me use the photocopier. I spent probably a lot of money photocopying my PhD dissertation, and then I had to go back home to defend, and then I came back for real. So that was kind of how I started with Carl. And most of that work was based on this canine model of aging work. And I came and learned how to do neuropathology. And uh, so Brian trained me, and lots of other people in the lab trained me. I was an animal behaviorist. Go figure. And while I was doing some of this work, learning about immunistic chemistry, Carl said, hey, we have a couple of brains from people who died with Down syndrome. Would you take a look at these? I want to introduce you to Ira Lott, who's here too, to talk about this really interesting link between Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. And at that time, I think we had three or four brains in the repository, and I think Brian had a hand in collecting those. And that's what started my whole career trajectory into this whole space of studying Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome, of which UCI is internationally recognized. We are one of the pillar grants from the NIH. We have $100 million of funding. And that started with Carl saying, hey, why don't you take a look at some of these brains? And this is a, you, the theme, is, as you can see, is carrying through for everybody. So, you know, as everybody says, he's a powerhouse in the aging field. He still is a powerhouse in the aging field. Everybody still cites a lot of his work. In fact, I think I looked up to see how many citations Carl has, and it's a little nuts. So, um, but he's been a huge uh, mover in the field looking at neuroplasticity and finding treatments for people with Alzheimer's disease. But some of the other things I took home and learned from Carl, and I still continue to learn from Carl, is again, this team science concept. Carl really, I think, innovated that whole approach of reaching out to people he wasn't afraid to speak other languages. He wasn't afraid to say he didn't understand the other language. He still reached out to people all these years. And he taught me a lot of that. Um, and I think also during my tenure as a postdoc, he, he introduced me to so many people in the field. And what was really fun about Carl is we used to sit together in his office when he was having phone calls with the NIH. And I was a fly on the wall. And I got to hear how to operate with program. So he showed me all of those ropes. We would go to conferences and I'd walk with Carl all through that conference and he would introduce me to all the people along the way. So he, he really had a big hand in my career. So I think on a personal note, I wanna tell you a couple of things. Um, just, you know, We had a lot of fun together, Carl and I. We used to get together usually after work in my office when the phone wasn't ringing and people weren't around so we could really talk science. It was wonderful. As he does have this wonderful artistic side to him. And so one of the fun stories I'd share with you is Carl knows my parents very well. And he went up to Nova Scotia and stayed at their house. And he went around Nova Scotia and took pictures of lighthouses. And then he brought those pictures home and he painted them. And so Carl, mom and dad say hi. Irene and Dieter say hi. They miss you. They missed you by a couple of weeks. They were visiting, but they really enjoyed that time with you. So um, it's been a real honor um, all these years to be working with Carl, and I continue to work with Carl. There's lots of work I'm dying to share with you when we have time, but he has just been an amazing scientist, and he set an amazing uh, standard for all of us to try to meet, and I think he continues to be an inspiration. Thank you. Next year from Linda Sheck. Um, hi, Carl. Uh, it's my privilege to be here to share with uh, everyone the impact you had on the community by an act you took back in the mid-90s. Um, I was executive director at the Alzheimer's Association at that time, and the family was, were coming to us and saying, we want to go to the research conference at UCI. We, we, they were sneaking in, trying to get into the conference, and it was designed for researchers, the annual Southern California Alzheimer's Disease Research Conference. And so Carl said, we can do that. We can open it to the community. And you did. It was a huge success. Families went and could learn the research they were seeking, the answers they were looking for that were taking place right here in our community and from researchers throughout the country. And the testimony is that we just had our 34th annual research conference last month, and it was a huge success. 
Thanks to your vision, Carl Kotman. Next, Gary Roman. I wanted to do this a couple of weeks ago, but I've changed my mind. <laughs> I should have followed Cheryl. <laughs> Carl, <clears throat> that's what I used to say every day. Um, this is not about me, it is about Carl. And um, I want to thank Andrea Wasserman for leading me to Carl. I got here in 2005 and um, <sighs> operated the neuroscience program, PhD program. It was 50% and I was all over Gillespie doing whatever I could to secure money. And um, I was afraid of Carl, as some people were. Um, Carl was tall and he didn't smile much and just kept walking and did his thing and it was intimidating. And um, I had to look at my emails today. And so it was in um, 2000. 12 is when Andrea reached out to me because I was work Leslie Thompson was the director of the IMP and then she was closing down Mama G and I was working that 50% and I was all over that medical school of medicine campus and um, I had to find something to do and so Andrea is like hey how would you like to work for Carl and I'm like oh god no and um, it's like there's no way she goes come on you can do it she goes i'll help you and i'm like no i i know I, I don't want to be in that office and um didn't know anything about it but andrea said don't worry i'll support you and so when they say it takes a village you know i really believe i was part of a team it was you know carl andrea nadine dan nicole was in that little environment for me and a bunch of other people and I, I have a picture on my phone of a time when we took a picture. And so I wish I would have known there was pictures. I would have put it for proof. Um, Nadim said tonight, um, what you do, work for Carl for about a year? And I'm like, a year? And he goes like, two? And I'm like, no. So it was a total of six years. And um, when I was able to help out in BioSci and get you know this position full time, and do more. It was I had to say goodbye to Carl, and that kind. Of, I, I believe it or not, that like broke my heart. You know, I didn't want to leave completely. I wanted to do, you know, ten percent. And when I originally started with Carl, it was twenty five percent, but that twenty five percent was really two hundred percent, and it didn't. It did not bother me. You know, I look at the things I, I did for Carl, the training grant, um, his CV, his advanced, his career advancement things, all those things I had access to. You know, Carl, you know, it was an open book. He was able to contact me anytime. I'm hearing all these stories. Carl's would text me and I would just picture Carl. <laughs> What's my password to this? What's my password to that? what happened help you know and um you know i have a lot of secrets and um i never thought i would say that <laughs> um oh god carl you know i it was it was so great you know going in there i would go in there in the morning like before 7 30 i go in there in the morning i'd set things up for the day and then i take off and i drive to biosci and then I come back after lunch and then Carl would need something. I'm like, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And you know, I, I, my, this thing here for me today, I wanted to just say, Carol, Carl, thank you for all you've done for, for the world. And um, more importantly, I wanna thank you for the respect and the trust that you put into me. Um, it was definitely there. And I'm sure the rest of you feel that way too, based on all the stuff I'm hearing. Um, when Carl would be at his laptop, when the gentleman was talking about the the computer i'm like oh you have no idea and you know carl wouldn't be looking and i take his computer and i clean it with alcohol and i make it look fresh and it's like carl your computer's clean and then carl would get back and i would just say i would just say how can someone so successful take so long to do something you know he with with the technology of the change and that's and that's what i i loved about being with carl's carl Carl did adapt to this change. The world was turning faster and he, I mean, he did so much, but yet he couldn't keep up with these things. And then I would show him and he's like, how'd you do that? 
And then I would think to myself, who in the hell did this for you for the past 10 years? You know, and you know, when Nadine would tell me, you know, thank you for, thank you for doing this, you're a big help to this, to this club, it, it meant the world to me. And so for that team, um, and I'll end with this, um, losing my parents, both my parents in the last two years to dementia um, and not knowing what it was all about until coming here. And then um, seeing Carl, when, when I heard what had happened, you know, it was important to me that Andrea got me to the facility to see him. And um, I just got in his face because I know how to operate with someone who's in a home. And um, I said, Carl, who am I? And he's like, oh, you're Gary. And I'm like, that's it. You know, and that was good. It made me feel good. And, you know, what um, the thing of relating, I, I said to Carl, I said, Carl, has anybody else come to see you today? He goes, yeah. And I said, who? He goes, Gary Lynch and Chris Gall. You know, it wasn't true. But the conversations continue like they used to continue with us when we were in that office. And so um, I can't thank you enough, Carl, for the memories. And um, thank you, Mo. I'm going to read a letter from Aleph Prieto Moreno, who's now an assistant professor at the National University of Mexico. Dear Carl, greetings from Mexico. Today, as one of your countless trainees, I would like to share some memories of my stay in your lab. Everyone in this event honoring you is aware and surely highly impressed by the long list of scientific and academic achievements of your career, so I will focus on specific moments where your guidance was fundamental for me. You have truly made an impact on me and my professional growth, thus further extending your legacy to the next generation of neuroscientists. We met in ADPD, uh, we met at the ADPD meeting in Prague in 2009. I look back at all the later years working in your lab and learning from you during your almost everyday visits to my bench, where you spent time discussing ideas and giving overall feedback. About feedback on manuscripts, for example, I was impressed by how remarkably expedited it used to be. I gave you my progress at noon and you showed up at my bench with the corrected manuscript that afternoon. On top of all the edits on my manuscripts, I recall several of Kotman's quotes for making a clean and solid grant proposal or paper. I also remember the invaluable opportunity to meet several leaders in the field when they visited your office and you invited me to show my data. I enjoyed getting to know you. For example, I had a good time attending the ASN meeting in 2018 in Riverside when I picked you up at your place and we drove up together. We also traveled to the National University of Mexico for a symposium, which was critical for getting my independent position. You always supported my path to get my lab and I will never forget your smile and handshake when I told you I finally got it. Your support did not end that day as it has been witnessed by all lab members, as well as by Andrea Wasserman and Nadine Madi. I wish you all the best in your retirement, having more time for your hobbies, such as painting and gardening. I am sure there will be an opportunity to say hello in person and see your new paintings. With all my gratitude, Aleph. I'll now invite Dr. Ira Lott. Afternoon, I first met Carl in 1985, about two years after I was recruited to UCI. <clears throat> I knew even then that Carl Kotman was an esteemed researcher in Alzheimer disease. I came down to the campus to determine his interest in studying the connection between Down syndrome and Alzheimer disease. I didn't know much about Alzheimer disease then, and Carl had no direct experience in people with Down syndrome. But together we started a collaboration, not necessarily that 
type that you published together, but one that developed Down syndrome as a major research initiative. Carl immediately embraced the future of this undertaking. Part of his genius was to see where the field was going years before other people did. And he kept to that vision when we were with Tuck Finch at USC. Um, <clears throat> and uh, when we, when Carl brought the uh, ADRC back to Irvine, and we went through many grant renewals, and with the recruitment of Frank LaFarla and Josh Grill. Initially, there were two of us. Today, Carl, there are over 100 Alzheimer researchers at UCI involved in studying some aspect of Down syndrome. UCI was instrumental in establishing an international group of investigators, forming the only Down syndrome core in the ADRC network and the recruitment back to UCI of Elizabeth Head. There is now a trans NIH initiative on Down syndrome and a commensurate focus by the National Institute on Aging. <clears throat> Carl retained his support for a Down syndrome initiative through lean years, productive years, years when naive external reviewers asked, why are you studying Down syndrome? I so enjoyed the afternoon when Carl and I would discuss science. Modestly framed on his wall was a certificate indicating that Carl was one of the most cited investigators in the history of Alzheimer research. Carl never boasted about his accomplishments. His vision was firmly fixed on the future. Was Carl warm and fuzzy? Not so much. <laughs> when Carl gave you a compliment, you earned it. When he gave you a criticism, you probably earned that too. He set high standards and expected one to aspire to them. So bless you, Carl, for the contributions that you have made to the field, to UCI, and to people with Down syndrome. We wish you peace. Next, Dr. Marcella Wood. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Josh and Andrea and Sasha for putting together and anybody else involved in putting together such a beautiful event. Carl, it's absolutely wonderful to see you again. It's heartwarming. Um, I wanted to share uh, kind of a couple of perspectives. One is chair. I was Carl's chair for nine years. Um, and there's a little little thing I wanted to share with that. And then also as collaborator. And so we've been collaborating, oh, probably for at least over a decade. And, and there have been some wonderful times in that. And so first as chair, um, I, I never wanted to become chair of the department. Uh, I have uh, Frank LaFrola to thank for that. Um, but uh, when I first took over, I'd only been uh, three years past tenure. So I was still pretty new. And it terrified me to think of having to deal with these absolutely famous scientists, nationally, internationally renowned, uh, just pillars in the field, uh, such as Carl. And, and Carl was probably the one I was most afraid of. And when I started, it, he was actually very warm and fuzzy. And he helped me a ton as chair. I went and seeked all sorts of advice on how to be chair, how to run a department, how to, how to uh, manage different opinions and different faculty, et cetera, all the problems that come with it. And uh, Carl was just terrific at helping me think through those things. He gave me enormous historical perspective on the department, how it had come to fruition, uh, what its strengths and weaknesses were. We had a great time talking about strategy. Um, and, and 
that helped me a lot when I was working with my strategic planning committee for the department to see where we would be headed. Um, as you've heard a bit of a common theme, Carl was always way ahead of people. And, and that really helped with trying to figure out how do we position the department to grow in the right directions? How do we hire the right kind of people? And Carl always had an opinion on people and what scientific directions to go into. And so for that, I'm ever grateful. Um, but really, I, I spent countless, countless hours in Carl's office uh, and his, him and my office discussing science. And, and that was really the best part of all of it. Um, my lab works on epigenetic mechanisms of memory. And there was a problem that had been bugging me for quite some time, which was uh, yeast. So baker's yeast, what you use to make bread. Uh, yeast can uh, use its epigenome to encode a past experience. And that can then change how a yeast responds to a future experience. And it was beautifully elegant experiments done back in 2002 by the yeast genetics community. And I wanted to figure out if the epigenome could encode a past experience um, in something as complex as a mouse. And so you're going from a unicellular organism to a multicellular complex organism that is full of amazing behavior, a mouse. Uh, I had no idea how to really go about it. And, and Carl and I would have tons and tons of discussions about aging, epigenetics, uh, just neuronal function, synaptic plasticity. Um, and then it really hit me, his exercise work was the key to figuring out this problem in translating this yeast phenomenon into a behaving animal. And I remember going back to one of his uh, papers, one of the first papers that he published in Nature in 1995, I have the paper here. And in this paper, he shows how rats that, that exercise uh, release a neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And there's a little graph in there. And then there's one figure, just one figure, where there's a, a controlled brain slice, very little BDNF, and then a, a slice from a rat that's run for seven days and explode with BDNF. And, and I've never seen another nature paper with one figure from basically one rat with one slice. That's the paper. That's it. The whole paper, the nature paper. And, and, and that's just kind of case in point. Carl is just such a legend in doing simple, elegant, but very impactful work. And that paper, it's been cited, I think, over 1,400 times now but led to other papers and reviews, like I just saw a review that Nicole and, and Carl wrote on the effects of exercise and how it can be therapeutic, et cetera. It's been cited over 4,000 times, but then exploded into the mainstream about how we think about exercise and how it affects us. And, and so it was that exercise work and discovering how different patterns of exercise um, uh, uh, manipulate BDNF and these temporal patterns that they had discovered. And that's where the answer to what I had been looking for for so long and so many years and talking to so many people, um, it was right there. It was all based on Carl's exercise work. Um, that led to uh, lots of grants. Um, it, it was always fun writing a grant with Carl and, and folks in his lab. Uh, the grants, I, I think every single one we ever put in was, um, you know, regardless of the score, it got funded every single time, the first time in. It, it was incredible. And then sometimes the, the you know, NIH would come back with a, a budget cut. And I remember one time I, I called up Carl and said, Carl, we got the grant, but we, we got a budget cut. And he's like, well, we'll see about that. And, and he came over to my office and we called uh, our program officer and the grants management specialist and uh, we get on the phone and he said, uh, I disagree with this. Very respectful, very nice, but very forceful, very direct. There was not going to be a cut to this grant. And within less than 10 minutes, there was no cut to our grant anymore. Um, and so Liz, you were saying how he, he taught you how to navigate uh, NIH. Uh, I learned a lot in, in those days too. Um, so uh, 
overall, uh, I can't be more grateful and thankful to my experience in working with Carl, both as a scientist and working with him as a chair of a department. Um, it's just been unbelievable. I was never in his lab, but I, I'm very closely uh, associated with a lot of people from the lab, and uh, it's been just tremendous. It's impacted me in every way. Thank you, Carl. Dr. Leslie Thompson. All right. It's okay. Well, I um, I actually didn't know I was going to, but I'm happy to. I'm really honored to be here and to speak about Carl, he's he's really had a huge influence um, also on, on our work and just as a role model in many ways. Um, we have a lot of collaborative uh, work that we do and Carl's always led the way in that and, and being able to watch how he's he's sort of organized things and the way he's he speaks with people. Um, I've worked on a training grant with him. We've had a lot of with Andrea and he on their training grant and um, working out uh, retreats for the students and the trainees. And I was just always so incredibly impressed about the way that his perspective towards training students at UCI and the insights he would have. And we developed these programs together with Peter and he and Andrea and and he just he 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 had a perspective that I hadn't really seen and appreciated before in the way that he designed these programs. And as we've heard from so many people sitting in his office, brainstorming, really getting into the nitty gritty of what people need um, in their training and how people learn the best and how to bring the strengths out of the students. And so I, I really appreciated that. And when we were in Gillespie together, coming down to his lab and meeting with people in the lab and everybody being so open and engaging and collaborative. And I just have learned a lot from Carl and I really appreciate that over the years. Thank you, Carl, very much. Dr. Mark Fisher. So let me tell you my Carl Cotman story. Um, before I came to UCI in 1998, I was on faculty at USC. And back in the 90s, there was a fair amount of interaction between the medical schools. In fact, there was even some discussion about merging the two neurology and neurosurgery departments. And one area where there was considerable interaction, you, you've already heard a bit about, and this was the uh, joint UCI-USC-ADRC. Now, this was an arrangement that did not always work smoothly. Um, and I got to hear the USC side of things when there were some difficulties. And in those, sto in those stories of difficulties, one name kept coming up. Uh, the name was Carl Kotman. And that was the first I had ever heard of Carl and, and the stories were, were kind of scary. Um, Carl sounded like a really tough guy. 
And so a little bit later, uh, I was offered and accepted the chair position in neurology at UCI. And my department chair at, UC, at USC, uh, he wanted to mentor me as I was about to embark in this new world as a department chair. Well, you know, he, he and I had what might be termed a, a complicated relationship. And um, it was a while before we really got together. And this was our mentoring session. And, and so my USC chair says to me, says, Mark, I'm gonna give you one piece of advice. I'm gonna give you one piece of advice as you start off as department chair at UCI. I said, okay, what's that? Yes. So he says, wait until your second year to take on Carl Cotman. <laughs> so at this point, I'm terrified. I mean, who is this guy, Carl Cotman? And what am I getting into moving over to UCI. Well, as it turns out, Carl was terrific. He was everything you could ask for. If there was anything on his mind, he told you. If there's anything he needed, he let you know. There were no games, no narcissism, just a real straight shooter. We did some great things together. We ran a joint conference honoring Stan Vandenort held in this very room. We sat together at the now infamous UCI Neurology Rolling Stones Night held at Anaheim Stadium in 2005. And later on, we got to be good friends and worked on all kinds of projects together, including strategizing on various political issues. And so I just wanna say, Carl, we miss you. We love you, and we want to see you back at UCI real soon. Dr. Oz Stewart. Hello, Carl. It's so nice to be here. Um, it's a little scary. Um, turns out, I guess I've known you, Carl, longer than anyone else who's spoken. And actually, I think uh, I've probably known you longer than Cheryl has, because I came to your lab in 1970. So this was three years after Carl moved to UCI um, and became a, an assistant professor here. I don't have pictures from that time. That's probably a good thing for both of us. Um, but there are many good memories, and everything that everybody has said about what a wonderful lab you actually ran uh, absolutely ring true. Um, I wanted to actually do a couple of things. First of all, say thank you for several of the things that you've done for me personally over my career. Um, I actually um, came to UCI as a graduate student um, it was a very nice thing. I had applied to a few places. My undergraduate record was, all right, not great. Um, and, um, but I really wanted to come to UCI because I'd heard about this department called psychobiology and the wonderful things that were going on here that really sounded like exactly the kind of thing that I wanted to do. Uh, it was really the first neuroscience-like department in the, in the country, even before Harvard, by the way. Uh, Harvard won't admit that, but it's true. Um, and so I applied, and I didn't get in. And in uh, early May, I have uh, a, va a very vivid memory. I got a phone call, um, and it was Carl. He said, well, you were amongst our top tier, but all of them turned us down. And going back to something that Cheryl said, you seem to have worked really hard as an undergraduate. So I'd like to invite you to come to my lab and uh, join our graduate program out here. I just, yes. So 
That's how I got into UCI. Thank you, Carl. That's number one, thank you. Because that brought me to UCI, which set the stage for everything else uh, that I've been able to accomplish. I wanted to actually say something about science that not uh, any of you have mentioned so far. So my time in the lab, uh, I joined Carl's lab when he was still really doing just strict biochemistry. He was a biochemist and he was studying the proteins of the synaptic density. And about one year into the lab, he teamed up, here's that word again, with Gary Lynch, because they had an idea about how maybe to study reorganization of the brain after injury using histochemical techniques. And it was a remarkably uh, forward-looking thing, a bold, people have used those words before, genius, um, actually fearless, because everybody then believed that there was absolutely no way that an injured brain could grow. Impossible. Once the brain was developed, it was done. Injury, you're done. But they started this project, and I was fortunate enough to get in, involved in it. And um, in that uh, time that I was there, they really led the world, I would say, in establishing that there is synapse growth after injury. And my role in it was actually doing physiology to test the idea. Everybody said, well, maybe there's this little reorganization, but do they function? And so my part of the project was to actually study whether or not these new synapses functioned. Carl was really good, and you know, several people have already said this earlier, about reaching out for help. So who do you go to for help and advice with physiology? Well, Sir John Eccles, he won the Nobel Prize, right? So Carl invited uh, Sir John to the lab, and he, was, he basically asked Sir John, what can we do better? How, what, do, what do we need? What equipment do we need to be able to answer this question? And Eccles said, well, the most important thing that you need to be able to do physiology is a comfortable chair. I said, because Carl had us sitting on these little round stools, no backs to it, you know. Um, so uh, thank you for getting me uh, involved in that very uh, incredible project. And, you know, again, it, it, the impact of that work that he led back then just can't be underestimated. Understand Now, today, we all think the brain is plastic. It grows. It does this. It does that. There's the guy who led the field in establishing that. Um, just on a personal level, Carl has uh, been very important for me in my own career. He got me my first job. Uh, back then, uh, it was occasionally possible to get a job directly out of graduate school. Carl happened to be sitting on a study section with a uh, chair of neurosurgery at University of Virginia named John Jane, and uh, John was looking for somebody to come in and work with them on uh, cortical lamination, and Carl said, hey, I've got this guy in my lab, you know, he's doing physiology, and he's, you know, the, the hippocampus is kind of cortex, so uh, you might want to look at him. So Carl uh, gave me a very nice recommendation, and I did interview there and, and was hired, so he got me my first job. Thank you, Carl. Um, one thing Eileen uh, talked about a little bit was his very important role in the regeneration community. And one of the fearless experiments that uh, Carl started actually when I was a student, uh, that was some of the first steps he was taking toward translation. He said, all right, we've got this kind of evidence for uh, growth after injury. Let's see if we can get regeneration. I said, Carl, that experiment is never going to work. Nobody gets regeneration in, in, the, in the brain. Well, we did the study, and it, it kind of worked and it kind of didn't, but uh, that was my first entree into regeneration. And Carl then, as Eileen has talked about, became one of the key members of the scientific advisory group for the, uh, now what's now called the uh, Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. But what he did in addition was actually bring the Reeve Irvine Center back uh, here. So there's a story that goes with this. Um, Joan Irvine Smith uh, was a horsewoman. She uh, was very impressed with Christopher Reeve because he didn't blame his horse. She wanted to do something for UCI. She wanted to establish a center. And she reached out to Christopher Reeve and um, to allow uh, UCI to use his name for this center, the Reeve Irvine Center. Um, now, the, the, the uh, scientific advisory group and leaders uh, of the uh, Christopher Reeve Foundation 
I didn't really appreciate the fact that UC Irvine was a kind of real place. You know, they're East Coasters. So uh, and anything um, south of Battery Park and, and west of the Hudson was, you know, backwater territory, basically. So um, they invited uh, the, the team out, Christopher Reeve came out, and Carl was the one that actually convinced them that yes, UCI was a real place, yes, there was good science going on here, and yes, this was the place where they ought to allow Christopher to have his name used, the only place it's being used in an academic institution. So they, Carl is the one that really brought the Reeve Irvine Research Center to UCI. And this is where my second big thank you comes in, Carl, also uh, got me my second job, which I moved from uh, Virginia, uh, where I'd been for 25 years, to become the first uh, director of the Reeve Irvine Research Center, because I ran into Carl at a meeting, at a San Diego SFN meeting, and we were talking, and he said, you know, you really ought to take a look at this job. And I sort of knew about it, but I hadn't, and then I started to learn more, and I came out. And so, again, Carl, thank you for this, uh, for my second and, uh, I guess, last job, um, <laughs> I think, because I don't think I'm going to go anywhere else. Uh, you, you've just been a, a tremendous, uh, uh, a, a tremendous impact on my career and, and made just such a huge, huge difference to my ability to, to accomplish anything, really. You brought me to graduate school and everything that follows. Um, I want to just say one more thing about Carl. Um, Jim Geddes used the word, uh, his work has stood the test of time. And, and that's true, but I want to add one phrase to it. So one of the things that we did for a number of years was to give the Reeve Irvine Research Medal for work in spinal cord injury that was really outstanding. And uh, actually, Carl was one of the winners of that uh, medal along the way. But one of the phrases that goes with that medal, the recognition for that medal, is that the work has stood the test of time and scrutiny. And that absolutely is the case for everything that Carl has done, everything that you've heard about today, everything that has been the foundation of all of his Alzheimer's disease work and everything else that he's done. Not just time, but scrutiny from other scientists. And again, the genius, the boldness, the fearlessness with which Carl has attacked problems that are important for all of us is just unmatched. Thank you, Carl, for me personally, and I think I can say thank you for everything that you've done for the University of California and everything that you've done for the Alzheimer's community. Thank you. Uh, we are not surprisingly a bit behind schedule because of uh, the number of people who uh, wanted to communicate the tremendous love, respect, and gratitude for Carl. We have two speakers left, but we did want to um, leave time in the agenda if anyone here wanted to approach a microphone and offer any uh, thoughts before our closing speakers. You might have to turn it on, or I can... He tried to talk me out of going, but I went nonetheless. And about two or three years there, we had started to pull together a pretty good team, some new faculty, and we had the opportunity to apply to NIH for a center grant. And I was asked to PI that grant, and my first step was to call Carl to see if he would act as an advisor. And so he got involved in the project from the very start. We were able to pull together a team, pull together a grant, and to the surprise of everybody, 
on our campus and myself, we got the grant. And then Carl took one step further and served on our scientific advisory board for the next eight years. Came up, really mentored the development of the faculty that were there, helped us develop programs, met with the president of the university to tell them how important it was and how this field was. So his, his impact reaches far beyond Irvine, even to the corners of Montana. Um, and for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you, Carl. Hi, for those who don't know me, which are probably very few here, I'm Pat Kaslak. I was with Carl from 1983 to 2003. And I came here uh, fresh out of graduate school with a young Rusty Gage into Carl's lab because of the, the breadth of research that was going on. Carl was well known in the field for his work in neuroplasticity and uh, at that time. And uh, I was fortunate enough to start it with partial brain transplants and some neuroanatomy and then eventually get my psychology license and work in the clinic and do imaging. And I was doing collaborations with people I had no business of doing collaborations with uh, from a variety of different fields, including his daughter's science project in high school. Um, <laughs> Carl, we may have been one of the few people who published a, a, have a high school science project that was published in a scientific journal. Uh, I, I will keep this brief, though. Um, I'm glad to be here today, Carl, and, uh, because you've touched the lives of so many people in so many ways that uh, we really appreciate your efforts, your guidance, your mentorship, uh, always providing advice, never micromanaging, but making sure that we worked hard, uh, getting those phone calls on Friday uh, or on Saturday or Sunday morning in the lab saying, oh, uh, Pat. Uh, who else is there? Uh, <laughs> well, Jim's here, but he's un in the microscope room, or, or Kevin's in the dark room. So um, that wasn't always the case, but we worked hard. We had great guidance. We became friends. We became family. We became collaborators. Uh, so we thank you. Two more speakers before our reception. First, Dr. Frank LaFerla. Wow. Well, if I start talking about all my time with Carl, it will take a really uh, long time. And so much of what I wanted to say has already been said. But I owe my entire career here at UC Irvine to Carl. Because back in, uh, I think it was January of 1995, I was a young postdoc. And I happened to go to the uh, Keystone Conference on cell death in Durango, Colorado. And I heard, um, you know, read about this phenomenal figure in the Alzheimer's field named Carl Kahneman. And, you know, AD was still a relatively, you know, new field, especially when Carl really got into it around 1987, 88. And it was just starting to pick up steam. And so I met David Cribbs at a bar and I said, oh, wow, you know Carl, you work with him, what's he like? Can you introduce me? I was so afraid. And uh, to meet him, and he couldn't have been the, a more gentle, kinder individual, particularly to someone who was absolutely a scientific nobody as I was, and just started talking to me about this position at UC Irvine, the Department of Psychobiology at that time, was looking for an assistant professor, and they were at the tail end of interviewing for this. And I guess many of the other candidates came through and said that they came to Irvine because that's where they used to buy marijuana. And I was one, I was one of the few people who didn't come here for that. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know where Irvine uh, was when I uh, until I uh, interviewed. But that was a recurring theme. Uh, Carl and I were often on many of the scientific programs. And all these investigators from across the country, and in fact, across the world, would say to me, you're at Irvine, and you know Carl Kotman. 
I am so afraid of him. And I'm like, oh, he's a teddy bear. Let me in introduce you to him. And I would introduce them. I said, Carl, I want you to meet someone. This person uh, wants to get to know you. And then afterwards, every single person came back to me and said how much of a pleasure it was meeting Carl and how kind and how much they enjoyed talking science uh, with him was. And that was uh, my experience. For better part of 20 years, our labs were right next to each other and our offices were uh, right adjacent um, to each other. And I can't tell you what an exciting time it was in 1995 to get here when the field had just discovered a couple of the genes that were associated with Alzheimer's disease and it opened up all these possibilities for cell biology and for animal models. And uh, there was just so much excitement. Um, you had uh, David in the lab and Andrea Wasserman and Pat Keslack and um, uh, Christian Pike and Brian and Eileen. And even though I wasn't an official member of his lab, I essentially operated like I was. I was adopted, so to speak. And there was this intellectual you know, enrichment that was there. And the other thing that I was impressed about was how much money there was there, right? <laughs> All of the other colleagues in the department were stressing about you know, paying money for Xeroxing and not having this journal, not having that. But if you were affiliated with Carl, you were rich, you had it all, right? And so it was a pretty uh, great experience. But you've heard it said um, today from almost every speaker how incredibly insightful Carl was. And if he has um, any superpower, he probably has two major superpowers. The first is that ability to see and cut through BS and just see the future direction that science is going into. And I could just give you one example, and it's one that Ira Lott alluded to, uh, that Carl, when he established the Alzheimer's Center here, had Down syndrome as part of the Alzheimer's Center back in 1985. That is truly remarkable, because when I took over for Carl uh, as director of the ADRC, as late as 2011, 2012, some of our external advisors were telling me that we should cut the Down syndrome program, that it had no part being, it had no business being a part of our Alzheimer's Center, and that, Alzheimer, that Down syndrome was purely a syndromic condition, and it, we would not be able to learn anything about it. It wasn't until the NIA actually had a summit on Down syndrome that the attitude changed in the field and people came to me and said, wow, UC Irvine is so far ahead of the curve and it's because of Carl and um, his vision in that regard. And so I think all of us owe Carl an amazing uh, debt of gratitude. Uh, you know, throughout the years, he, we're lucky at UCI that he has stayed here. Uh, it's not from, for lack of trying by other institutions. Uh, many of you may know this, some of you might not know that the NIA actually tried to recruit Carl to be their director. And part of the reason that the Alzheimer's Center was established was in part because of the retention offer that the campus made to keep Carl here. And he absolutely, I mean, was a first-rate scholar. I forget how many publications he uh, had. I, I stopped counting after 800 or so. I'm sure he's up to 1,000 by now. But the thing that Carl, that I was always awestruck by Carl was how much he cared about the Alzheimer's patients and the people in the community. And Linda, you said it very well. When he put together that conference, he did it mean from his heart because he genuinely cared about making a difference in their lives. And that truly resonated with him. Uh, it was my honor to take over for him. Uh, Ira, you said he was not known for many compliments. I, you know, I've gotten a few out of him over the years, and one of them was a few years ago. He came into my office and he said, you know, my boy, uh, you did pretty good in taking over and taking this to new places. So, so uh, uh, and that was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, greatly appreciated. And I think the fact that the Institute is now on our F2 generation. Carl was the founder, I was F1, Josh is F2, really speaks to the you know, legacy that you helped to establish. So I think we should all get, get up and give him a standing ovation for everything that he has done.
So thank you. And with that, let me invite his daughter, Dana, to come down and say a few words. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for um, all of your contributions and comments today. They're very much appreciated on behalf of the family. Um, this has truly been a very difficult time. Sorry, not usually very emotional. Um, but it's really clear that you all have benefited from him and that he means a great deal to you. And he means a great deal to us as well. Um, I so appreciate all of the collaboration that you all have done. And I think if there's anything you could do for him at this point, it would be to visit him and talk to him about like what you're doing. Because there's not much science conversation going on in his life. And he misses it. Um, so clearly... Um, he's been great for all of you, and he was a good dad when he was around. Um, <laughs> he did travel a lot, and we have very fond memories of when he would come back sometime in the middle of the night. Um, we never really knew when, but there was this bakery um, along the way where he would pick up these, like, big danishes, and we would wake up in the morning, and there would be the danish, <laughs> and we knew dad was home. Um, so... He also took great pride in art, and um, he used to wander around a lot at the conferences, and when he traveled, apparently, and he would look for things that he would bring to us, and we had this doll collection um, that he would search and search and search to find the perfect doll that was handmade. It had to be handmade, um, and, you know, from that particular place and culture, and um, I still have those dolls today, um, somewhere in a box, um, but they were very meaningful. Um, we missed our dad when he wasn't around, but we knew he was doing great things and really appreciated um, all the contribution that he's given to the world and to all of you and um, the science. So, um, well, you all heard about his garden and his painting and um, all of those things. Um, I just wanted to bring you up to speed on his family, of course. Um, he now has, um, well, of course, there's the four kids. We all thrived in academics. Um, uh, his oldest daughter uh, is a pediatric nurse practitioner. Um, she has two children. Um, her daughter went into physical therapy. Um, she has a three-year-old and another baby due any day now. Um, her, her son has um, just opened a coffee shop in Harmony, a tiny little town. So if you're ever up the coast, um, please uh, reach out to us and we'll make sure you get to stop by there. Um, <sighs> Cheryl, um, an amazing artist who many of you know. She's got a master in fine arts. She's got a biology degree. I remember going to the lab one time. And I was like, where's Cheryl? And, oh, she must be in the brain room. And um, I walked in there, and Cheryl's there. She's holding the brain. And she's like, oh, well, let me just put my brain away. I'll be right with you. <laughs> that was one of the funniest uh, instances. We all spent our time running around in the lab. I remember I was super scared of the basement because that was where all the mice and the rats were, and they freaked me out. So I went a whole different route and um, became the first lawyer in the family. So I guess, you know, maybe some of those negotiating skills have come into play. And I do <laughs> intellectual property and high-tech sort of startups um, and am an entrepreneur myself. Um, so, um, uh, and then uh, my brother followed in my footsteps, I think, um, and became also a, an attorney. Um, so when we uh, learned um, that... Uh, when things happened this last year, um, Cheryl and I took it upon ourselves to try to figure out how we could preserve the history and the legacy and what we could do to just make sure that it didn't get thrown in the trash or, you know, thrown away or somewhere it's in an archive or, you know, just not recognized. So um, just 
through a series of amazing um, events and connections, we've been working with a Dr. Jacopo Anessi from um, UCSD, uh, where he started his research lab, and he now operates an independent institute in pursuit of a higher mission alongside their research objectives, which is to share neuroscience knowledge and tools with the community, which I think is really um, even just that much more meaningful after I've heard all of you talk about the collaboration that has gone on um, in your science community. Um, Dr. Jacopo Nessi is a graduate of Rome uh, University in Italy and then to University of College of London to Dartmouth and his primary goal in the field of neuroscience is to conduct research that is open to public engagement and promotes the highest standards in data sharing and collaboration within the science community. And they have a um, fully functional research laboratory as well as um, actual brains and slides and things that the community can come to and through government grants also they are able to bring in some of the underprivileged children to expose them to science and research and opportunity that they wouldn't otherwise be able to explore. Um, and what I also like and it's just really amazing how it's come together is that their curriculum draws inspiration from the rich history of the interplay between art and science and notably embodies by the human artist, humanist artists of the Renaissance, like Leonardo da Vinci. And their work with school children, school children aims at creating a new diverse generation of Renaissance thinkers who will approach world problems in currently unthinkable ways. So they are trying to stimulate personal artistic expressions in young scholars while offering them more um, relatable, benign, um, images of the world and science and showing pathways to successful careers in fields that they might not um, have thought about. So um, we're pleased to tell you all that the Brain Observatory has agreed to preserve Dad's library of reference books and research books and some other items from his office within their institute, which is down in San Diego, um, right by the trolley station. So when that is actually all put together, we will let you know and hope that you can come down and visit. Um, that's where I'm at, so I'll be happy to hear if you're coming down and show you around. So um, with that said, um, please, please visit, please keep in touch. Please reach out to Cheryl or I if you um, have any questions or just um, you know, want to talk or get in touch with our dad and, um, and your Dr. Carl Kotman. Um, so thank you again for being here. We really appreciate, appreciate you all and um, look forward to the reception and the rest of the evening. Uh, without further ado, that concludes the formal presentations and there'll be a reception uh, immediately at the top of the stairs and then uh, dinner follows. Thank you.